Welcome to North Park's 180 Ministries, and uh, glad that you're tuning in. Um, and uh, we're continuing uh, in our mini-series, uh, our second part of our mini-series, uh, Running the Race Set Before You. Running the Race Set Before You. So this is part two of that mini-series. So if you haven't had a chance, go back and, and watch Running the Race Set Before You, the first one that we did. We took time out of the mini-series and um, did a message called, in, in our North Park 180, we did a message called The Good News. And it just was, it felt like it was time to just kind of address a lot of the growing concerns around us that we have regarding what um, our society looks like and things that involve the COVID-19 virus. So we took time out to do that. So also, if you have a, haven't watched that, um, and you've got some concerns about the way things look and look in our life right now, watch that lesson as well. But most importantly, go back and watch uh, the message that Pastor Lynn preached on Psalm 94 with uh, regard to wicked government. So watch that. So helpful. So helpful. Uh, this is part two, uh, running the race set before you. Um, we took this from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and grab that. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 is what where we're taking our uh, mini-series from. Let me read this for you here. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Okay, so two weeks ago, we talked about the race God has set before the believer to run. The race that God has set before us to participate in as believers. We looked at what begins our race according to these verses, in other words. Um, and so just a quick recap here. Uh, number one, we looked at the example of the great cloud of witnesses that had gone before us that he refers to in, in Hebrews 12, 1 there. Uh, you know, in other words, um, this is a great uh, cloud of witnesses in Hebrews 11, that hall of fame of faith of these great men and women of God who ran their race successfully for the kingdom of God. They were faithful to God to the end. They endured uh, much for the kingdom of God because they stood on the truth of who God is and what his word says. And um, it cost them, but they endured to the end. They put off every weight and sin that clung close and uh, that clings close, and they put that off and ran a good race with endurance. And we look to them, that motivates us, that should inspire us to do the same because we look at Old and New Testament saints. That's who inspires us. We look at the Old and the New <laughs> Testament believers, and that should inspire us, motivate us to run the race marked out for us. Number two, we recognize that the race God has for a person is only realized by the believer. Only realized by the believer. This means that in order to run the race God has set before you, you must be in the race God has for you. John 3.3 3, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. You, you don't even know you're, you, you're supposed to be in a race unless God has opened your eyes, causing you to recognize that he has a kingdom will for you to pursue. Um, otherwise, you're just running the, on the course of this world, that default, that default course that's under satanic influence, and, and you're controlled by your sinful desires within. You're just on a default course that Ephesians 2 talks about. Number three, um, you know, we looked at what begins our race. Number three, we began to look at what hinders the race for a believer. He says uh, to lay aside every weight and sin which clings close. So we examined, according to our key text, what it is the first part last or two weeks ago, the first part, what weighs the believer down? What's slowing them down, keeping them from running a good race? Do you remember this? There is often a weight of undisciplined thinking that many believers carry into their race. They carry, they're not ready, in other words, to suffer for God's kingdom priorities. 
And there are many Christians unwilling to suffer the loss of the things they hold dear in this world. And that keeps them unfit. That keeps them from running with endurance the race God has set before them. The example of this that we gave was Luke 9, 62. Um, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for kingdom for the kingdom of God. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is Jesus' words. Uh, why are they not fit? Because they're carrying a weight, right? A person can agree to begin a race, in other words, go to work in God's kingdom, put their hand to the plow, and still be spiritually unfit because they won't stop looking back at what they're leaving behind in this world. They won't stop doing that. They won't stop uh, seeking to draw their endurance from the world still instead of fully uh, you know, drawing that from God and God alone. This weighs down the believer. It weighs down the believer who, with the cares of this world, in other words, uh, they're weighed down. They don't have fresh legs for service in the kingdom of God. So uh, that weighs the believer down. When the believer, however, strains ahead or seeks first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, they are seeking a course marked out for them that God's spirit enables them to run and his word directs this process. Hopefully that makes sense to you. Uh, if um, you need to, go back and refresh on lesson one if necessary, though. Make sure that you do that. Uh, now on to new material today. Um, continuing to understand what it is that hinders our race, what it is that, that uh, slows us down or trips us up. And we're looking at the second part of uh, that verse, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And sin which clings so closely. I used to love watching the show Seinfeld. It's such a hilarious show. Um, and the joke about Seinfeld was, I think Seinfeld was the one that put this out there even, was that it was a show about nothing. Um, it was just a show about nothing, but that's not true. It was not a show about nothing. It was a show about lying. <laughs> it was a show. That's what made it kind of funny and, and later on for me sick to my stomach at the same time when I watch it because it's just one lie after another, one lie after another, one lie after another. You had to keep the lie going so that people wouldn't find out the truth about who you really were. That was Seinfeld, you know. I always think of the episode with George lying, pretending to be a marine biologist just to impress the, the girl, right? And um, they had to keep that lie going to the point where he trudged out into the ocean when a whale was in trouble and had to actually try to be a marine biologist. And that's a really fitting description of, of a lifestyle of sin that, um, you know, just using the example of the sin of lying. There is no more uh, self-preserving sin than lying, for example, self-rescuing sin than lying, because you, you don't know what to do, you don't want to, the truth to be discovered about you, so you lie. You rescue yourself from the reality of, of the potential uh, judgment that would ensue if the truth were known about you. Lying comes to your rescue, but it doesn't really, does it? No, you're still in your sin. Lying is still... Um, it's still a cover-up, in other words. It's not really saving you, right? And there's a difference between believers' sin, okay, and the unbeliever in sin. There's a difference between believers' sin and the unbeliever in sin. Unbelievers, for example, no matter what good they believe they do, it does not overcome the status of being in sin. Ephesians 2 talks about this. You're either in sin or you're in Christ. It's a status. The sinner slash unbeliever does not have the Spirit of God, for example, within them, causing them to do the good that God deems good. And yes, believers can sin, but they're no longer in sin. But unbelievers, it's a lifestyle. It's who they are. It's what they do. Lying is their native tongue, in other words. Um, it's the way that they save themselves, rescue themselves. There's so many lifestyles of sin that come to the rescue of the unbeliever because theirs is, salvation is in their sin. 
Does that make sense to you? Um, the unbeliever is not merely someone who sins, but someone who cannot overcome their status of lawbreaker sinner, right? In order to please God. Romans 3 um, says no one seeks God and all have become unworthy. Romans 3, 11 and 12. So you cannot break God's law. You cannot be a lawbreaker in, in the status of lawbreaker and sinner and please God at the same time. It's like being in two different places at once. The unbelieving heart can only seek, listen, can only seek to please itself. And the unbelieving heart will lie to itself about that motive even. No, that's not true. It is true. It is true. The unbelieving heart only seeks to please itself. It will always lead the sinner away from the things of God in pursuit of its own idea of what is good. And Hebrews 3.12 shows us that, and we'll look further at that later on. But however, believers uh, have a God-ordained race to run, um, and the writer of Hebrews says to them, don't let sin trip you up. Don't let sin that clings close, um, you know, you need to lay it aside, in other words. Uh, so believers he's talking to there about, you know, make sure that there's not sin in your life that's keeping you from running with confidence the race that God has set before you. And if you look at Ephesians chapter 2, go ahead and turn there if you have a Bible. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we'll see more in depth what it means there to run the race. Um, Ephesians 2, 10, these are the words of Paul. He says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus uh, for good works, which God prepared beforehand, set before us, do you see it, that we should walk in them. There is a race set before us to run. This has been prepared for us in advance before the foundations of the earth were laid. God prepared in advance for those who would come to know him, ordained to know him, to run the race set before them, good works which he has prepared in advance for them to walk in. Believers are new creations in Christ. That's their status. They desire to please God. And God has prepared in advance, set before them works that his Christians are to walk in. Or as Paul would refer to in Philippians 3, strain ahead toward, right? Believers are living on kingdom priorities, serious, serious about their pursuit of accomplishing God's will. Good works that he's prepared in advance, set before them to accomplish. This is what their life is to be about, pleasing God. And our text in Hebrews tells us that one of the things that trips up a believer, keeping them from running the race uh, set before them, is sin that they are still entangled in, sin that they are still caught in. The language of our text is very descriptive. Pay attention to that. He says, lay aside sin which clings close. Question. How do you lay aside what wants to cling close? Well, the term lay aside in the Greek is actually a term that is uh, uh, apotithemi, which means to put off, to put off, lay aside in the Greek to put off. Paul uses this term, uh, for example, when writing to the church in Ephesus, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 22, he says, to put off your old self, to uh, apotithemi, your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, to put off that former manner of life that is corrupt through deceitful desires. He's telling believers in Ephesus, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, right? It's corrupt through deceitful desires. So just as one would put off or lay aside any weight that would slow them down from running their race, right? We must also do the same with our sin. Except when it comes to sin, there's one problem. It clings close. The, the Greek word for clings is a word that means entangles. It entang we're in, easily entangled in it. So the writer of Hebrews is telling these Hebrew Christians, to put off sin which entangles. How do I uh, summarize this? It would be like quit messing around with any sin in your life you're unwilling to part from 
because sin clings close. It entangles you. A little bit, for example, of indulging in former manners of the flesh, former life pre-Christ, a little bit of indulging in that old sin from your old life goes a long ways. It, it begins to entangle. It begins to cling close. Um, these are stronghold sins. Every one of us struggles with sin, but there are certain sins that cling close. Are there not? There are certain sins that are very difficult to lay aside or to put off. They cling close. They, are, they have a strong grip on your thinking, stronghold. That's what a stronghold is. And they desire to keep their claws in you. So a little bit of indulging in former manners of those kinds of sins go a long way. They are stronghold sins that cling close. They're easy to carry into your new life with Christ because of their tendency to cling close. So if you don't put them off, they are habit forming very quickly. And a little bit of undealt with lust, for example, goes back to being a powerful obsession in your life. A little bit of that old desire to drink, a little bit of that old desire to smoke clings close and comes roaring in as a powerful urge that you're now caught up in or entangled in. And any little sin that you keep as you try to run the race that God has set before you becomes a big mess. It will constantly trip you up. Whatever you're unwilling to put off that belongs to your former manner of life, a life, Paul says, is corrupt through deceitful desires, will be the thing that takes you down. The wages of sin are still death. The writer of Hebrews is writing to these Hebrew Christians, but at one point in Hebrews 3, he says to them, watch now, pay attention to this, Hebrews 3.12, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an, un an evil, unbelieving heart. In other words, a heart still in that status of in sin. Take care, lest there be an, e an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God, but exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, for we have come to share in Christ if, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. We endure to the end. Run the race set before us, enduring, right? That's the mark of someone who's truly in the status of in Christ, born again. But take care. Take care lest you have an evil, unbelieving heart still in the status of in sin that's keeping you from running the race set before you, right? Because honestly, if we're going to do this right, at some point you have to wonder if a person is actually saved, if they are still entangled in habitual sin, sin they will not put off. At some point you have to wonder if a person has a regenerate heart when the actions of their life keep taking them back to their sin instead of toward greater affection for Christ that overcomes sin. You might want to check your salvation. If you're unwilling to lay aside the lust, unwilling to lay aside the addiction, unwilling to lay aside the anger, unwilling to lay aside the pride, and do so in favor of pursuing God's will. When there should be a life marked by greater affection for Christ that overcomes sin's hold, and instead it's still marked by a life that will keep getting tripped up by sin, entangled in sin, something's wrong. Because the definition that we have for sanctification is progressively being saved from the power that sin has over our lives. There should be a putting off evidence of being born again. The Apostle John says this regarding sin, that will not be put off. Turn to 1 John 3. 1 John chapter 3, and we're going to look at verses 4 through 10. This is so um, eye-opening, so clear, in other words. Uh, 1 John 3, 4 through 10. He says, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he, meaning Christ, appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin, 
No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever practice, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, watch, and he cannot keep on sinning. Because he has been born of God. He's born again. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not make, whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Remember how I said there's a difference between believers who sin and unbelievers in sin. Really, believers' sin is kind of an oxymoron, you know. In the end, it doesn't matter what you say you believe. Uh, it only matters what your actions reveal. The evidence, in other words, that supports your claim is important. Uh, believers are marked by their affection for Christ and his kingdom priorities. And unbelievers are marked by their affection for their sin and this world. Their priorities are still in the world. If a person says they love Jesus, yet, yet, they keep running back to their sin and the things of this world, they reveal what they truly love. They're not done with sin because they love it. No matter what they say otherwise, their unbelieving heart wins out. And you cannot lay aside what you're just not done with. Let me uh, close our lesson this way today um, by sharing a little bit of how this has worked in my life personally. Uh, let me give you my um, former battle with a habitual sin, and I think this will help. Um, you know, again, we're talking about still holding on to what God has clearly forbidden in your life. It's clear that God has um, shown you this is forbidden, that you need to put it off, and yet you're unwilling, and um, you're holding on to it. And, and when I came to North Park, I definitely came with many issues. Um, I was co a confused person. I had finally understood one thing, though. I needed help. So that was good. Um, but my marriage was a mess. My priorities was a mess. My theology was a mess. Uh, and, and, but at the same time, I really wanted for the first time, I think, in my life, I really wanted to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Except I had one little, so to speak, habitual sin I kept for myself, an addiction to nicotine. Now, I can just hear some of you and, and you're saying, well, that's not really a big sin or any sin at all, maybe. Um, it's, you know, it's debatable in people's minds. But listen, um, I was a daily habitual user of it, not an occasional every once in a while on special occasions kind of user, which is a rare breed to say the least, right? That's, I don't even know if that's a, truly a thing, but uh, needless to say, um, there was, I needed it. I needed it. I needed it or I was not going to be okay. That shouldn't be in the life of a believer. Where you need something so badly or you're not going to be okay no matter what God's word says. It doesn't matter how much affection you have for this thing over Christ. You just need it uh, or you're not going to be okay. You know, the addiction of nicotine, it, it clung to me and I held on to it. It had its claws in me and I was holding on to it. And uh, I concealed it for a while. I hid it from the leadership in our church and the church family for my first probably a couple years at North Park. And I even um, led worship with a dip in my mouth um, on multiple occasions. And instead of uh, Christ as my refuge, listen, instead of Christ as my refuge, nicotine was my refuge. Instead of Christ as my peace, nicotine was my peace. Um, for when I had it, I felt like I could be okay. I felt like as long as I had a can of chew, 
I had something with me to face the day, okay? And instead of Christ as my righteousness, nicotine was my righteousness in the sense of being covered by something is what, that, what I mean by that. But I began to get tired of carrying it into my new life, trying to make it work in my relationship with Christ somehow. Um, I began to get tired of hiding it from the church, from my family, from anyone who would wonder, you know, what's up with a pastor addicted to nicotine? Um, I tried to quit many times, but I would always come back to it because my affection for it was so strong. Can you relate? I'm sure you can. And the question becomes, how does one quit what's got such a strong hold on them? How does one quit habitual sin that they have great affection for? Well, this is what happened to me. I'm just going to testify to you what happened to me. One day I was reading in James chapter 1, and I came across this verse. Here it is, James 1.15. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. I'll never forget, I was sitting on the couch um, in my living room at home, re read that verse, suddenly a sobering reality hit me. Any sin, any sin that a person refuses to put off will become full grown and bring forth death. God had made it plain to me that if I keep holding on to this sin, it would kill me. Because any sin has a life cycle to it. And the wages of sin is death. In other words, it starts off small like a baby and it grows up in its old age and when it dies you die with it how much more evidence do we need of that sin when it's fully grown and it dies takes you with it i believed god i believed him i laid it aside i put off nicotine i suffered the loss of it as paul would say because Proverbs 9.10 became a reality in my life. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is insight. I believed that God was serious about sin. I believed him. David said in Psalm 51, against you and you only have I sinned. Talking to God, right? What he meant was God is the one who punishes sin. Full-grown sin kills, plain and simple, whether it's lust, greed, addiction, all sin, unbelief is what all sin is, unbelief. The act of not believing Christ is enough. John 16, 9. God is serious about our devotion to any sin, being greater than our affection for Christ, being greater than our surrender to Christ. God punishes sin, and that should be sobering. But Christ is the way of escape, and that should bring great joy. And the mark of a born-again person is one who puts off sin that keeps them from running the race set before them, that keeps them from straining towards Christ and running in pursuit of God's kingdom will for their life. Look to your life. If you say you're saved, what kind of race are you really running? Does your life reflect a growing affection marked by putting off sin and, and growing affection for Christ? Or are you still holding on to some sin in your life that is keeping you from running the race that God has marked out for you? Now is the time to be really intentional about the truth of that. Now is the time. Don't flatter yourself in your own eyes so much that you can't even detect and hate your sin. Now is the time to say yes God, I agree with you that I am holding on to sin that I have greater affection for than I do for Christ and his cross. Now's the time. Turn to Christ and admit your helpless condition in your sin and the grip that it has on your life and cry out to God in Christ to free you of that. Be 
bringing it into the light. Sin in the light cannot live. But kept in the dark, it continues to grow in your life until it reaches its old age and it dies and takes you with it. Be intentional about your sin. Where are you at with God? Where are you at in this race marked out for you? Turn to Jesus Christ. And as always, our North Park leadership is in place to help you as you walk out of concealing sin in your life and bring it into the light. We want to help you apply Christ to that and to understand what it means to know him and grow in a greater affection for him than for your sin. So reach out to us here at North Park Church. We're praying for you, and as always, we love you, we care about you. And for next week, we're going to continue um, the second part of what it means to lay aside the sin. It's going to really teach you some application in that process. So stay tuned for that next week. But until then, we'll see you again soon. Bye.